trying to stall till the online gets going. Where you at, Marcus? Let's go. All right, we on. Y'all love the Lord this morning? If you have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 31. 1 Samuel, chapter 31. I'm waiting for my eyesight to come in. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's not like I'm unprepared. I got something right here. Two more right here. Got some back here. Got some in the car. And in every room of the house. Open up, open up the drawer for the knives and the fork. And they got a pair of glasses right there. So I can see which one is the knife and which one is the spoon and which one is the fork. And all of them cost like $3 a piece. <laughs> I remember I was with, uh, I was in Detroit with Karen Clark and she couldn't find hers. Then she reached and pulled out a pan full of them. She said, I got these things all over the house. All of them come from, from, I still call it Revco. My wife be telling me it's not Revco, it's CVS. I'm saying it's Revco to me. And John Eagle is pick and pay. John Eagle is still picking pay to me. So, you know, it is what it is. 1 Samuel chapter 31. We're going to begin reading with the first verse. Then I'll go over in 2 Samuel for uh, several verses. Then we'll see what happens after that. Ready? Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishu, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul. And the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword, and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword, and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men, that same day together. Chapter 4, 2 Samuel. Turn right in your Bible. I'm going to read one verse. You can meet me over in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, 2 Samuel 4 and 4 reads, And Jonathan saw a son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Chapter 9, 2 Samuel, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master, son, all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. 
Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Let's pray, Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, amazing, magnificent, spectacular name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve. We thank you once again for allowing us access into your holy presence to partake of your holy word in spirit and truth and in the liberty that our great country provides. Now we pray your blessings in and upon us as we partake of your word. And we thank you in advance for every blessing that we receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. One more time. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Recently, I was... Uh, on social media that I don't do Facebook she trying to come to the altar and he grabbing security grabbing her like she posed a threat to the man of God she trying to get free but um, I was on social media, I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't do Facebook as much because there's too many theologians on there for me. <laughs> I'm telling you. And I recently saw one social media theologian. You know, and, and a lot of times I'll be about to respond, then I'll be like, man, what's the use? And he said that we should not even read the Old Testament because it was just some stories and that we really don't even really need the Gospels either. Just read the epistles because the epistles are applicable to the church today. And so I guess we can also disregard the scriptures in the epistle that says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for re reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. Or well, the scripture that says of the Old Testament characters, Paul wrote that the things they experienced were examples for us and that they were written for our instruction. That's why there are a lot of broken cisterns today sister and there's a picture the, the Bible calls them wells without water blind leaders of the blind because they somebody would read some stupid stupidity and some idiocy and some foolishness like that and not read the Word of God on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appeared to the disciples it said uh, he began to expound on the word of God to them. And it says that he began at Moses, which was literally the book of Genesis. He began the, at Moses and all the prophets and expounded the scriptures to those that were with him, his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Stephen, even in his defense, when he was going to be stoned, he started off in the book of Genesis in order to, amen, bring it into and expound upon the person, the character, the works of Jesus Christ. So I said that to say this, don't pay no attention to no nonsense like that. You know what I mean? Paul said, I declare unto you all the counsel of God. Another translation calls it the whole counsel of God. And God does not have two words. He only has one word. Amen. And his one word is this holy Bible, which consists of the Old and New Testament. You know, a guy called me, a guy called me, a preacher called me last, this past week. And, uh, and about something and I wound up having to can I say this in biblical expression let me see how I can phrase this biblically I had to tear him a new one <laughs> so, <laughs> I tried to make it biblical and um, he wants to tell me you know he's telling me something about the 
the permissive will of God. And I say, man, let me tell you something. God don't have three wills. God has one will. One will. You don't have but one will. God has one will. You don't have no will. That was this and this was that. Job said, for he is of one mind. And who can turn him? Amen. So there's a lot of nonsense and foolishness out here in these social media streets. <laughs> so be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Amen. Our narrative begins actually in 1 Samuel, that where I read. It begins in one of the darker or darkest days of Israel's history as a monarchy. Amen. They had been a theocracy, a nation ruled by God since Moses, continuing up to Samuel until the people demanded that they wanted to be like other nations and wanted a king. And so a monarchy was established, Saul being selected as the first king. And so, but this is one of the darkest days of their history. Their short, brief history is probably the darkest day of their short, brief history as a monarchy. And it opens up, our narrative does, during chaotic times and in the midst of warfare, in the midst of struggle and stress and, and strife and chaos. The army of Israel had gone forth, amen, to fight against their mortal enemies after the flesh, the Philistines, amen. And so you have the queen of Israel's fighting force, their elite fighting forces, the cream of their fighting men are gathered on the field of Gilboa, Gilboa, which means boiling pot. Amen, it was a hot place, a place of conflict and strife. King Saul is there. Amen. As well as his sons. Amen. Saul the king is there and the princes of Israel are there as well. Jonathan the crown prince next in line to the throne. He's on the battlefield. All of their commanders and their generals and their captains and their lieutenants and their foot soldiers are all there on that field on that day. It was the best and the brightest that Israel had to offer in defense of their nation. Amen. And it was a representation at that time on that field of all of Israel's manly vigor and all of Israel's strength, amen, get engaged in battle, amen, against the enemy. And then the news comes from the battlefield, amen, that the army of Israel had been defeated, amen. Uh, they had been defeated. Saul was dead. Jonathan had been killed. And their nation was undone. The foot soldiers fled. The generals, the captains, the lieutenants, the officers had all been executed, amen. And the nation is undone. Now, Jonathan's son, we read, Mephibosheth, amen, had been left at home in the care of his attendant, his nurse, amen. Uh, he had been left there in, his, uh, in their care, and, and he's five years old at this time, amen, a healthy boy. He has royal blood flowing through his veins, and he is a child of great promise, amen. Uh, uh, he's an heir to the throne. He's in the family. He's in the royal dynasty, amen. Amen. Now, he represents the future of his family and the future of the entire nation. Amen. You have to understand, gladness accompanied his birth when it was announced that another man child, a boy, had been born. That was a king's pride to have sons. Amen. It was a mark of distinction, a badge of, badge of honor. Joy filled his life. He was a child right here of unlimited potential. Amen. One with as much promise as human humanly possible. Y'all help me now. Amen. He was fortunate enough to be born into the circumstance that he was born into. He's raised in a palace. Amen. With the best of everything. He's carrying the expectations of the entire nation with him. He's, the, he's in line to be a future king in Israel. Amen. The future anointed man of God. The fulfillment of Abraham's prophecy when it was told to him that kings would come out of his loins. Amen. The Bible says, amen, that tidings came 
to where he was of Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his father's death, to, a, to the house where Mephibosheth was, amen. Now, the attendant that was uh, uh, supervising him, the nurse who was attending to him, amen, she picked him up and fled, the Bible says, amen. She's frantic with terror. She's, she, she's overcome with fear, amen. She's filled with worry and tension and, and, and anxiety and apprehension I've got to get out of here. And the Bible says that in her haste, amen, she drops the boy. In her interest of self-preservation, amen, she drops the one that she was supposed to attend to, drops the one she was supposed to protect, drops the one who she was supposed to care for and, and, and guard and nurture, amen. Now, now, maybe, and this is what I suppose, maybe she dropped him from the horse that she was endeavoring to, amen, uh, ride on to escape because the fall was great enough the fall was so great to make him lame when he hit the ground in both of his feet amen and so now he's on the ground amen broken in pain he's crying out in in agony amen and uh, and uh, now who picked him up we do not know who picked him up we are not told amen whether she stopped to retrieve him or she kept on going we do not know all we know is that when this now homeless fatherless child is lifted up off the ground amen he's now a hopeless helpless cripple help me somebody uh, when he is picked up amen once again by who we do not know uh, uh, he has now irretrievably lost the power to stand on his own and to walk unaided and unassisted amen he is permanently damaged he's permanently crippled he's permanently lame in both of his feet Amen. Now you have to understand, saints, that in any age, amen, such a calamity is bad. To be a cripple in any age, in any time, in any generation, uh, that's bad. But in that time, in that day, and in that age, it was social extinction. It was a fate almost as bad as death. And when his feet were shattered, when his feet were broken, amen, all of his future potential was shattered as well. All of his future your hopes and dreams were broken as well as a result of his fall uh, he would be forever disqualified from any amen uh, per, 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 uh, position that his future once held amen and he would forever be a misfit uh, he would forever be a reject uh, he would forever be damaged he would forever be flawed he would forever be broken he would forever be imperfect his life would be forever crippled uh, because of one incident because of one event that he himself had no control over y'all talk back to me I'll talk better than you I promise he would forever be impaired he would be helpless and codependent and struggling and living through life for the rest of his life his once promising future now seems so bleak his once promising future was now so hopeless because of one incident because of an event in his life that permanently disabled and damaged and incapacitated him. He's the saddest spectacle in Israel on that day. He's worse in worse shape than any amen dead soldier on the field because he's one that should be a king but because of events in his life he would forever be so damaged that he's now unfit for any throne and I sense today by way of the Holy Ghost talk back to me if I'm talking to you that there are those of you under the sound of my voice whether you're viewing online or right here in a Attendance that had become crippled. You become crippled psychologically. You become crippled emotionally. You become crippled spiritually, crippled socially, crippled relationally because of events in your life or any incident in your past that has altered and defined your present and your future. Because somebody who was supposed to care for you, somebody who you who you loved, or somebody who you trusted uh, somebody that you respected and regarded uh, because of their own self-seeking uh, self-serving uh, self-selfish agenda because of their own self-interest uh, and their own self-gratification uh, and their own self-aggrandizement uh, they violated your trust uh, 
disregarded the care, ignored their responsibility towards you, and caused you to become damaged beyond repair. Oh, don't shout me down. And consequently, they've rendered you unable to enjoy a normal life. And they've damaged your ability to walk through life correctly. Oh, come on, talk back to me. Some of you have not been able to function properly. You have not had normal social interaction. And you have been relegated to secondary status because you were mishandled. Help me, Holy Ghost. Because you were marred. Because you were harmed, amen, by somebody who was supposed to care for you and to carry you. But they were too busy seeking after their own self-interest, their own self amen uh, gratification uh, to fulfill their responsibilities uh, and fulfill their requirements towards you uh, and instead amen of, of, of uh, helping you uh, they hurt you uh, and harmed you help me Holy Ghost uh, and consequently some of us uh, have become so damaged uh, for, uh, for our life uh, in certain areas of our life uh, that we cannot be the person uh, that we were intended to be can I go further and make a plan? I've been alive now for um, uh, a while. I'm, 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 I'm leading off a third base. Amen. Uh, I, I hope I'm not heading home yet. But I'm leading, I'm not rounding third, but I'm leading off a third. The longer I live in this life, the more amazed I am that anybody is in their right mind. The longer I live, the more amazed I am that anybody is in their right spirit in today's society. Because so many people that should be kings and should be queens and should be princes and should be princesses. So many people that should be living in palaces and should be living in castles and have all the potential of the world have instead become damaged goods. Talk to me. And they're damaged goods due to the actions or indiscretions of somebody or some people that were supposed to love you and supposed to care for you. So many women are unable to love right. So many men are unable to father right. So many people are unable to husband right or wife right. So many are because of things that have happened to them that should not have happened to them. So many penitentiaries and so many rehab centers are full of those who should be millionaire businessmen. So many street corners are full of those who should be stopped brokers or wealth managers. So many shelter homes are full of those who should be lawyers and should be judges and should be politicians, should be school teachers or should be college professors. So many who should be preachers are dying in prisons. So many potential evangelists, so many potential are in insane asylums. So many potential pastors, so many potential prophets, so many potential teachers are strung out on drugs because of life-defining incidents and life-defining events that have crippled their ability to enjoy a normal lifestyle and live up to the potential that they were born with. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Whether you want to admit it or not, there are those of you that know that your past would have been so much more pleasant and your future would be so much more promising if you had not had what happened to you happen to you and you had not lived the life that you have lived if you hadn't been abused you would know how to enjoy a normal relationship but now you're suspicious and mistrustful of every man that you come in contact with oh, if you hadn't been help me Holy Ghost if you hadn't been beaten as a child you would be a better parent and you would not be your children if you hadn't been rejected you would have more stability if you hadn't been ridiculed you wouldn't be so self-conscious if you had had a same normal childhood you would have never gone to jail if your father had been there if your mother had been different
different you would have turned out differently you were once so full of promise you once had unlimited potential but life defining life changing life altering life damaging incidents and events have caused you to be crippled in one way or another talk back to me I'll talk better to you the fever says it became crippled because of a fall he became crippled because he fell because he was dropped because he was mishandled he became crippled for the rest of his life am I talking to anybody this morning or am I preaching to myself today amen he must have grown up under great disadvantages happened when he was five years old at an age where the older he got the less he remembered the trauma to the extent that his his disability had become normal to him he had to grow up under a great deal of disadvantages considering the fact that his lameness excluded him from engaging in normal social activity. Couldn't play with the other kids. Couldn't run, couldn't jump. Couldn't, couldn't do what other boys did. There are a number of believers today, under the sound of my voice, you are not able to enjoy or engage normally, socially. Maybe because of something that was going on at home. Maybe. I remember days we used to go to school in the morning and, and my, my classmates didn't know, you know, that my house was a war zone the night before. I'm talking about a war zone the night before. My old man was one of those guys, when he got mad, he tore up everything. My mother liked glass tables. I gotta break the glass table. I'm turning over the refrigerator. I'm turning over the stove. I'm tearing up everything in the house and then I'm out. After beating her up, she's there, her eyes are swole shut and he's gone. And we there. We eight years old, what we gonna do? Hit him in the head with a Tonka truck and run. That's all we could do. Now we gotta try to pick the stove up and we gotta try to put the refrigerator back and all that and mommy sent us on off to school anyway and you go to school and get in trouble and they don't know they just don't know a lot of you have been that same circumstance or similar circumstances people don't know when they see you because you hide it you mask it you conceal it under a veneer a facade of normalcy they ain't nobody. What's normal? I remember when they started coining the word dysfunction. And that was everybody's word, dysfunction. And I was like, dysfunction? Show me function. What is function? What defines my dysfunctionalism? You have to compare it to what's functional. I remember a guy and his mother went here a long time ago and he got a scholarship to play basketball at Ohio State and he, um, he didn't pass his SAT test. And this was back when he said these SAT tests are culturally biased. And you know, you have folk on the other side, they don't, they don't think it is. And he said, uh, it's culturally biased. He barely missed it. And he said, well, one of the questions on the test was, it was a, it was a multiple choice question. What is dinner time? And he was like, five o'clock. Seven o'clock, seven o'clock. But he was like, my father's not in the home and my mother works nights. And I'm at basketball practice every day. So when I get home, I make myself something to eat. Ain't no sit down dinner time with the fence. This ain't the Cleavers and Beaver and Ward and June and Wally. This is reality. So I don't know how to answer this question because it's not appropriate to my situation. Now, a lot of people that find yourself in, situ in, in situations that are not, are not appropriate to your situation 
and you find yourself, amen, dysfunctional in an area where that they say should be functioning. Here he is. There are a lot of people. You're not in, able to engage normally socially because of life-altering events and issues. I was watching, I was at the dentist's office and I was, they had the TV up there and Family Feud was on. And one of the questions was, what time is Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> the white contestant said one o'clock. <laughs> the black contestant said five o'clock. I was on the black contestant side. Cause at one o'clock, there's still some cooking going on in there. A whole lot of cooking going on. And, 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 and don't nobody even really have their clothes on yet. We don't have our Thanksgiving outfit on yet. <laughs> Come on, talk back to me. You get mad because somebody get there too early. Like, God, dog, here they come. Who coming up the driveway? They always here first. So you know what you do when they come early? <laughs> you make them help cook. <laughs> Somebody say amen. But a lot of people are not able to engage normally, socially, because of life altering, life shaping, life defining events or issues over which they had no control, but which proceeded to control them. Because how many of you have ever been controlled by something that you had no control over? Talk back to me. See, it would be different if you were being controlled by something that you had surrendered to. Amen. You gave, you had given control of it over it. Amen. Something that you had surrendered to and a simple reversal of decision. Amen. To reverse the control. But to be controlled by something that rendered you powerless and rendered you ineffective is an entirely different matter. To be controlled in your present by the events of your past. To have your future under the control of something that happened in your past by somebody else's mistreatment in the past how many of you know that's very very hard to deal with the succeeding years of Mephibosheth's life his childhood his puberty his adolescence his young adulthood his his emergence as a man they are not mentioned in the word of God amen it's left to our imagination as to the life he lived we saw him when he was five years old we saw him again as a grown man when next we meet him he's a man he's the last remaining one of the dynasty of Saul the last remaining member of Saul's lineage David is reigning where his father Jonathan would have reigned and should have reigned if he had lived. David is living in the palace that he should be living in and he would be living in if his father and grandfather lived. Not only has Mephibosheth lost his family and lost his kingdom, he's also lost all of his family's property. He's in the position of a physically helpless pauper. Doesn't have any money. He does not have any means of making money. He's totally dependent on the charity of others and he's contracted the habits of a dependent. Amen. See, some of people are like that. Some people are like that right now. You're dependent on others for safety or for sustenance or for mental and emotional stability. Uh, some of you, amen, need to, amen, look inside of yourself and see yourself in Mephibosheth. Amen. His mind has become as crippled as his feet. Amen. And he's begun to act like a dependent amen uh, a lame he's become servile and compliant he's become amen nervously uh, anxious to please everyone his all of his pride is gone his self-respect is gone his self-esteem his self-worth is gone his ego is all gone he's humbled he's he's he's, he's he, he, he humbles himself he's nothing more he even said to David I'm no better than a dead 
dog, amen. Not, not only do others look down upon him, amen, he also has begun to look down upon himself. He thinks nothing of himself. The calamity of his body has also paralyzed the movement of his mind. And when next we see him, he's living in the house, the Bible says, of Makir, the son of Amiel, in a place called Lodabar. And what is interesting in this narrative of prophetic significance is the fact, saints of God, that the name make here means pining. Pining means to be in a state of regret. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now, Mephibosheth, his name literally means shameful thing. He's spending his days in make here in a state of regret in a town called Lodabar. Lodabar means a dry place. It means a wilderness. And there are too many today under the sound of my voice that are ashamed of your past, ashamed of what you did, ashamed of what was done to you. Things happened in your life that you never want anyone to know about. You never even want to think about it. You'll never even tell anybody. You're ashamed of incidents. You're ashamed of issues in your life. And as a result, you're in a wilderness in your mind. You're in a dry place, regretting the way that your life has been lived, grieving over your misfortune and longing for a better future. If I'm talking to you, talk back to me. You've been in Lodabar for so long. You've been in a wilderness for so long that you cannot imagine life outside of it. You're in a wilderness in your mind, a wilderness in your spirit, a wilderness in your soul, regretting the mistakes that you made, regretting the things that have been done to you, grieving over your dilemmas, longing for relief in the house of make here. Somebody say amen. Make here, the Bible says, is the son of Amiel. M A L. M A L means people of God. So you're among the people of God. Help me, Holy Ghost. You're in the household of the people of God, but you're pining away in a wilderness, even though you're among the people of God, because you've allowed events of your life to put you in bondage and cripple you for the rest of your life. Up, oh, somebody say but God somebody say but God but 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 God look now in chapter 9 see that's not the conclusion of the whole matter that's not the end of the story or the narrative in chapter 9 we see David oh, he's amen a pre he's a type or symbol of Jesus Christ in his role of prophet priest and king he's sitting on a throne he's wearing a crown that he never would have accepted if Jonathan had lived and David remembers his friend Jonathan and the covenant that they had made and he seeks out Mephibosheth he asks his servants is there anybody left alive of the house of Jonathan of the house of Saul does he have any relatives is there anybody left David here is a type of the father who remembers his covenant with Jesus to bless his seed after his death and seeks him out in his crippled condition in spite of his lot in life no matter that he can't walk right he seeks him out in the wilderness help me Holy Ghost that our lives have become and he brings us out of shame and he brings us out of grief and he brings us out of regret sets us at his table makes us members of his household gives us our daily bread and restores to us every single thing Thing that the enemy has caused us to lose. Somebody shout hallelujah. Mephibosheth was still a cripple, but now he's a cripple in the king's house at the king's table. And all of us, yes, we are crippled. We are unable to function normally in certain areas of our life. All of us are disabled. All of us are dysfunctional. All of us are damaged goods. All of us are misfits. All of us are rejects. But once we become a part of the household of the king, all Oh, once we are invited to sit at the king's table by crippling it becomes my crown because the Bible says his strength is made perfect in my weakness and God will never 
without me, Holy Ghost, lead me the way I am. He will turn that incident. He'll turn that issue. He'll turn those events that crippled you into the source of your strength and the source of your anointing. He will cause that thing. Help me, Holy Ghost. Cause that thing. Help me, Holy Ghost. He'll cause that event. He'll cause that activity that shamed you and damaged you and disabled you. He'll cause it to, to empower you and enable you to do exceeding abundantly above anything you can ask for, anything you can think of, and cause all things that happen to you to work together for you to shout about it. Shout about it. Shout one more time. Y'all help me preach right now. Look at that person next to you and tell them, say, God is bringing you out out of that wilderness, out of that shame, out of that regret, out of that hurt, out of that pain, out of those bad memories. He's bringing you out of that wilderness, out of that issue. And you're going to sit at the king's table. You're going to dwell in the king's house. And God is going to restore everything the devil caused you to lose. Shout glory right there. When David sat Mephibosheth at his table, he did more than just help a cripple. He took his disability up onto the mountaintop and transfigured it. When he sat him at his table, amen, he connected that costly fragrance of the alabaster box to Mephibosheth's life. When he sat him at that table, he made it possible for the book of Job to be written. He made it possible for a person that's been broken by life, by adversity, by the burdens of this world that he made it possible for those that have been crippled by the issues of life and disabled by the attacks of the enemy to be lifted up on high seated at the king's table and restored to them everything that they had lost despite your issues despite your problems despite your lameness despite your circumstance somebody say help him holy ghost and here's what you have to understand. It says, he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. God does not always do away with what crippled us. The after effects might linger forever. We might still and stay crippled forever. We might not ever fully recover from the hurt. We might not ever fully recover from the pain. We might not ever fully recover from the abuse, from the mistreatment, from the rape, from the molestation. We might not ever fully recover from the divorce, from the pain. We might not ever fully recover from the embarrassment. But this tells me that yes, you might be crippled, and yes, you might stay crippled, but God God is going to bless you anyway. Somebody shout glory right there. He'll bless you in spite of your crippling. He'll bless you in spite of the hurt. He'll bless you in spite of the issue, in spite of the problem, in spite of the incident. How many of you believe that? God will bring you out and bless you anyway. Shout about it. David. David, he brought Mephibosheth back to the palace. He brought him back to the palace, back into his household, sat him at his table, and blessed him. And the reason why David blessed Mephibosheth is the same reason why God is going to bless you. Because when David looked at Mephibosheth, he did not see him as he was. He saw him as he should be. When he looked at Mephibosheth, he did not see a cripple. He saw a king. When he looked at him, he saw his father. 
He saw him in the image and likeness of his father. He saw his father's face. He saw his father's eyes. And he did not see a pauper. He saw a prince. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see a reject. He doesn't see a misfit. He doesn't see an alcoholic. He doesn't see a drug addict. He doesn't see an abuse victim. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a reject. He sees the child of the king. He doesn't see an abuse victim. He sees royalty. He doesn't see a broken misfit. He sees a rich landowner. So God says about you, what David said about Mephibosheth, I've got to restore him back to the image that I have of him. I can bring him to my table, make him a part of my house, restore to him all his stuff, and start treating him like a king needs to be treated. I know he's crippled, but that's all right. I know what he's been through. I know he's been hurt. I know he's been damaged, but I do not see the person that he is. I see the person that he should have been. Shout about it. God told me to tell somebody this morning that he doesn't see you in your issue in your problems, in your struggle, in your mistakes, in your failures. He doesn't see you in your dysfunction, your disability. He doesn't see you in your anguish and pain. He doesn't see you as you are. When God looks at you, he sees you as you should be. And God told me to tell somebody this morning, he's going to fix you up, restore your goods, bring you back so you can finally see and you can finally be the real you the true you oh come on somebody right there he said you're going to realize your potential you're going to achieve your goals you're going to amen receive your promise and he told me to tell you a couple more things he told me that you need to start seeing yourself Stop looking at yourself as you were or as you are. Start seeing yourself like God sees you. He said, not only are you going to come out of Lodovar, you're coming out of that wilderness. You're coming out of a constant state of regret and a constant state of shame and a constant state of grief and a constant state of pain. He said, you're going to come out of that. He's going to bring you out of regret and remorse. And he said, not only are you going to come out, you're also going to come back. Look at that person next to you before I stop and tell him, say, after I come out, baby, I'm going to come back. I'm the comeback kid up in here. God is bringing me out and God is bringing me back. After I come out, I'm going to make my comeback because see, is one thing to come out. You can come out and still, amen, not be where you want to be. But somebody say, I'm coming out and I'm coming back. I'm coming out of the wilderness and coming back to the palace. Coming out of decrease, coming back into increase. Coming out of sickness, coming back into health. Coming out of sadness, coming back into joy. Coming out of confusion, coming back into peace. Somebody say, I'm coming out. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm coming out. And I'm coming back. I'm coming out of loneliness. Coming back into a relationship. Coming out of stress. Coming out of confusion. Coming into calm. Coming out of addiction. Coming into sobriety. I'm coming out of therapy. I'm coming back to my throne. I'm coming out of sin. Coming back to sanctification. Coming out of fornication. Coming back to celibacy. I'm coming out of shame. And I'm coming back to glory. Open up your mouth and give him praise God is going to bring you from regret to restoration not living in the past anymore not living in and, and, and being confined in, in what I did or what was done to me or how this happened or that happened and how that was this and this was that God is going to bring you from a condition 
of regretting the life that you lived. And he's going to restore you back to the person, to the position that you were originally intended to be. Notice something. After David sent for Mephibosheth and brought him into his house and brought him to his table, we don't see, we don't see David saying anything about Mephibosheth's lame feet. See, people love to point out your defects. People love to point out your flaws. Love to remember what you did or what happened to you. But when God brings you to his table, when he makes you a member of the household of faith, not only did David not bring it up, nobody else in the house brought it up either. David said, from now on, I want y'all to treat him like a king. And when everybody saw David bring Mephibosheth into his house and bring him and sit him at his table, it shut the mouth of the gossips, the tale bearers. When God brings you to his table and makes you part of his house, nobody can ever bring up what you did who you were or what happened to you because once God brings you out and once God brings you back what you once were and what you once did does not have any more relevance or significance I'm almost done watch this the Bible then goes on to say that my people shall have had a young son he had a young son the insinuation being that after he was restored, he began to function socially normally in spite of his disability. And he went on, he was the last of his line. He thought it would end with him, but he went on to produce an heir. He went on to produce seed. In other words, he became productive. He was supposed to be the last of his kind with no hope for his future. A helpless, hopeless, destitute, lame, disabled dog. He now produces seed. He produces an heir. He enjoys a normal relationship. He has a wife. He has a normal relationship with someone who saw past the lameness of his feet. They saw past his disability and did not mind enjoying a normal relationship with him. God will put you with people to see past whatever your flaws are and love you for who you are. Once God brings you out and brings you back, he'll put you with people that don't mind being in relationship with damaged people, disabled, dysfunctional. In spite of your limp, in spite of your liability, in spite of whatever debilitating issues you experienced in life, they want to be with you, for you. And so he produces an heir. He produces something that for all intents and purposes, he had no business being able to produce. His circumstance and situation said he would never be able to do anything like this. And he named his son Micah, which means who is like the Lord. Who? Oh, somebody give him glory. Once God brings you out and once God brings you back, he's going to cause you to produce something. He's going to make something so meaningful come out of you that when everybody sees it, all they'll be able to say is who is like the Lord. Shout about it. He's going to bless you so much. Bless you so good. 
with something that you never should have had, <laughs> never should have been able to do. Who is like the Lord? When they see you living good, living large, rolling, 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 rolling. You rolling like raw high. Look at somebody say, roll on, big ol'. See, the young folk don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about rolling on. Roll on, big ol'. When they see you, the only question would be, who is like the Lord that they serve? Can y'all help me testify? Can y'all help me preach before I stop? Get out of your seat and go to three people on the other side of the room and just ask them a question. Say, who is like the Lord? You don't even have any business being here today. Who is like the Lord? You should be at the end of a crack pipe or the bottom of a bottom of a liquor bottle. You should be out on a street corner or in an insane asylum. You should be in a rehab center or a hospital bed. But you're here this morning lifting up the name of the Lord, giving him glory, giving him honor, giving him praise. In spite of everything that you've been through in this life, who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord that you serve? Aren't you glad that God interrupted your life and brought you into his house and sat you at his table and made you part of his family? Aren't you glad that God remembered you when you were yet dead in your sins and brought you and translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son? Open up your mouth and give him glory and shout, who is like there's none like it. There's none like it. There's none like it. There's none like it. There's no one like him. You shouldn't be here today. You're supposed to be a statistic. You should be in the morgue. You should have a toe tag on while you're in a body bag. They should be visiting your grave site on Memorial Day. But here you are, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting it and giving God praise in your right mind with your right spirit. Somebody open up your mouth and give him glory. In spite of everything that the enemy did, he might have taken other family members, but he didn't get you. He didn't get you. He got everybody else. He thought the entire family line had been wiped out. He thought everybody would be on drugs. He thought everybody would be alcoholics. He thought this, 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 this generational curse would get everybody. But he didn't get you. God remembered you. He sent the Holy Ghost to get you. Brought you into his house, sat you at his table, and restored you to your place in him. Shout about it right there. To be honest, when you think about it, you're a living, breathing, walking, talking miracle. It should have been gone. You should be anywhere else but here. Who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord? And you know what God told me to tell somebody this morning? He said, he's just getting started. Oh, somebody give him glory right there. He's just getting started. The best is yet to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. And you might be crippled. Might be lame, might walk with a limp. Might be somewhat damaged. Might be somewhat crazy. I know I'm half crazy. But I, I'm my wife's crazy person. I know she, if she ain't crazy, she can sure go crazy. See, being crazy and going crazy is two different things. How many of y'all aren't crazy, but sometimes 
for make you go crazy. Sometimes my wife asked me, why are you trying your best to make me go crazy on you? I say, because you look cute when you go crazy. <laughs> I like when you go crazy sometimes. Because it's my crazy. We each other's crazy. Say amen. But God is going to bring you back. A lot of you today have suffered some trauma. You've had things happen in your life. It shouldn't have happened. But it did. You shouldn't have been treated the way you were. But you were. That knucklehead should have treated you better. But he didn't. And you know what? To be for all intents and purposes, it is what it is. But I'm not going to continue. David said, I'm not going to leave him in that wilderness, in that dry place, in a state of regret. Thinking that there was nothing better than what he's already experienced. I'm going to bring him into my house. I'm going to restore it to him. God will restore your joy, your peace. He'll restore your stability, your sanity. It's not good for you to not be happy all the time. It's not good to walk around. You used to smile so much with somebody and just got you to the point where you're internalized and everything and you're not as, as, as effervescent and exuberant as you were. He's going to give you your smile back, give you your joy back, give you your peace back. And give it all back in spite of. In spite of. He's going to bless you in spite of. Lift your hands. I'm trying to stop. Lift your hands. Father in the outstanding, tremendous, magnificent, spectacular name of Jesus. Once again, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you for the light, for the enlightenment, for the illumination, for the edification, the exhortation, and the comfort that accompanies the reception of your word. Now I pray for each and every one of these precious saints, these precious people, under the sound of my voice, those that have been bruised and wounded and damaged and hurt, have become disabled by the issues and events, by the vicissitudes of life. Those who have had unfortunate and unpleasant circumstances and situations, those who, amen, had unhappy childhoods, those who have had bad marriages, bad relationships, those that have been hurt by life and people. I pray, O oh Lord, for a spirit of restoration to envelop them, amen, to penetrate into their spirit, into their souls, that you lift them up and lift them out of any hurt and pain and regret and shame and grief and turmoil that they're presently carrying, that you lift them out of that burden, lift them out of that bondage. Bring them totally and completely into your household, O oh Lord. Restore unto them the joy of life and the joy of their salvation. Restore their self-respect and self-esteem. Restore them mentally physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. Restore unto them everything that the enemy caused them to lose. Bless them exceeding and abundantly above all that they can ask or think. Erase the pain, the stigma, the shame that they've been carrying. Cause them to walk in the newness of life. And we thank you in advance for deliverance. We thank you for restoration. We thank you for rekindling the fire and the spark that had gone dead in us. And we give you glory, honor, and praise right now. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. 
We look forward to what you have yet to do. In Jesus' name, we have a spirit of expectation and anticipation for the blessings that are going to overtake us and run us down. And we give you glory in advance and praise in advance. In Jesus' name, if you're in agreement with this prayer, clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give him all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Shout hallelujah. Shout amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Who is like the Lord? There's none like him, no way, no how. What we used to say, I dare you to try him for yourself. Ain't he good? <laughs> God, hey, you, God make you sing the Campbell Soup song. Mm -hmm, good. Amen. The Lord is going to bless you. You're here today because the Spirit of the Lord drew you here. And he drew you here for a reason. I don't want you to go back into the memories and the bondage of past experiences. And don't let anybody rekindle those emotions and those thoughts and feelings inside of you. Let them go. Forgive everybody. I don't say forget. Don't forgive and forget. You forgive and remember. But the remembrance won't bring back the pain that the event caused. Amen? Amen? Listen, right now we want to take this time in our service unto the Lord, in our love and honor and respect and reverence for the Lord, to bless the Lord with our tithe and with our offering. Amen? We bless the Lord with it. We bless Him. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruit of all your income. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst forth with new wine. In the book of Psalms, I believe it's the 96th Psalm, the Bible talks about honoring the Lord. He said in the 96th Psalm, give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Now, right there, the translators put a colon because a colon signifies an interruption in the sentence and a clarification of the thought. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. What's said after the colon actually interprets and amplifies the preceding statement. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. Bring an offering, bring an offering, and come into his courts. How do we give the Lord the glory due unto his name? By bringing an offering and coming into his courts. Then he said, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. In other words, we cannot properly worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness means separation. Sanctification. We cannot worship the Lord in the beauty of a separated life unless and until we brought him that offering. That's why the Lord told them in the book of Exodus when he was giving instructions on coming before him in holy assembly, he said, don't let anybody appear before me empty-handed. Don't come in here empty-handed. That's what the Bible says. Let no man appear before me empty-handed. Let him bring an offering come into my place. So we're going to bless the Lord right now. I want those of you that are watching online to go to Givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com, or text to give, PayPal, Tithely, whatever platform you utilize, you can see it on the screen, and we're going to bless the Lord with our very, very, very best offering. Give him, pay our tithe on this morning because we love the Lord. We are members of his household. We're seated at his table. Amen. And we're doing what members of the household of God do. The Bible says our conversation is in heaven, right? The word conversation is the Greek word anastrophe, which literally means citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. As citizens of a kingdom, amen, we support that kingdom through the paying of taxes, tribute, tithe. Amen. We're paying our tithe. 
we love the Lord. The Bible says in the book of uh, Hebrews that when we pay our tithe here on earth, God receives it in heaven. It says, of whom it is witness that he lived. In other words, you can't honor a, God, a non-existent God. Our tithe, of whom it is witness that he lived, our tithe testifies to our belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We pay our tithe, I'm saying Jesus is alive. Jesus is Lord. I honor him, I love him, I worship, I praise him, I magnify him, I lift him up, I glorify him, I exalt him, I esteem him, I admire him, I respect him. The Bible says where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. You know, somebody said, put your money where your mouth is. No, it's you put your money where your heart is. Whatever you have a heart for, that's what you spend your money on. What they say, three books that are vital in the church. The good book, the hymn book, and the checkbook. But we're going to substitute checkbook for debit card. <laughs> you really want to know how much somebody loves the Lord? Look at that bank statement. That tell you everything right there. They can praise, they can shout, they can hallelujah. I remember one time church we went to Annette, one of the elders there, and I just happened to be up there one day. And the pastor called him into the office because he was, he was one of the ones, he wanted the microphone all the time, he wanted to be big shot, rolling over people and everything. Hey look, this guy don't pay his tithes. And the pastor brought him in the, off, in the office. My wife and I just happened to be up there. And what was happening while we were up there, we were outside. You know how the office was, church was going. And this guy came left out in the huff. What's wrong with him? And we had a good relationship with the pastor. Man, what's wrong with him? He said, I brought him in to talk to him about the fact that he didn't pay his tithes. And then he done left the church. You know what he said? My time is my tithe. The Bible said, the pastor told him, the Bible says, whatsoever you sow, that you shall reap. You sow time, you reap time. <laughs> and he called himself going to run out. And you know what kills me? I'm going to run out and start my own church. Now the money, now he got some money to do some, something with the Lord with. I mean, it didn't last. I mean, how long it lasts? He, he was like Orpah on the road to Bethlehem. He walked off, we never heard from him again. He went from being somebody somewhere to being nobody nowhere. And it was all about, you know, that's why Jesus said, watch this, people honor me with their lips. The Lord said it, Jesus, but the hearts are from far from me. How do you tell if somebody's heart is far from God? Where your heart is, that's where your treasure would be. If your money is far from God, I don't care how loud you shout, how loud you, my bit much you dance. If your money is far from God, you can honor him with your lips, but your heart is far from God as well. Amen? Amen? Don't get down. I ain't trying to depress you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to share with you something I've learned over 40 years of salvation. Amen? And it's been working for me so far. And when something's working for you, you want to share it with other folks because you feel if it's working for me, it can work for you too. Pay your tithes. Give the Lord your best offering. Amen? Amen. Now listen. What? What you shaking your head no for? My wife's birthday is Wednesday. <laughs> the wife of my youth. When you look back on it, we tell each other, man, you know what? We was just babies. We were younger than our grandbabies are when we got together. We were younger than our grandbabies when we got together. And you know what? God gives certain people special grace. Giving it to her for me. <laughs> We've been together a long time. Amen. And every time I look at her now, I see that girl that I saw in that magazine that day. She was a model, and I seen the magazine, and they're like, man, who is that? And like, she downstairs. Downstairs where? <laughs> I still got that magazine. She looked exactly, Leah, Leah Leah's father had put it together. 
that their father had, had, was a publisher at that time, and he had a magazine, and she was one had his had his uh, had his sister-in-law be a model on one of the pages, and uh, I saw it in, and it was it was lust, I mean love at first sight. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give y'all a tip. Before a man will love you for who you are, he got to like you for how you look. You know what that means? When you're single, I'm sorry, ladies, you got to be on your A game at all times. Amen. I want you to got him in and flip the script. Now you ain't got to worry. You got the rollers in your hair. You can have that old raggedy house coat that you've been wearing for 30 years with a lint balls on and this stuff. You can, you can do all that then. But until then, say amen. And brothers, be on your A-game too. You ain't all that. You slob, you. <laughs> We're going to bless the woman of God for her birthday. Y'all yeah, want to bless my wife for her birthday today? I think they're going to put something up on screen. There it is. Come on, let's give a hand. Let's clap our hands for our woman of God. Come on, let's give, give honor to whom honor is due. Y'all know one thing about me, right? Ain't no shame in my game. And so I have no problem saying this, and I don't care who don't like it. And when I say it, y'all gonna agree with me. She's a better pastor than I am. Look at y'all, you better not, you better not say amen. I was waiting to. I think she's a better pastor than me. I really do. I really do. But guess what? I don't mind. She makes my job a whole lot easier. Yeah, she be getting mad at me sometimes. It's sad, and I'm glad, but it ain't right, but it is. You know why? Because y'all don't call me. Her phone rings with the saints from before she wakes up in the morning to after she goes to bed at night. And she constantly lifts you up in prayer and she loves y'all know how y'all know how compassionate she is. You know how caring she is. She remembers stuff that, you know, we'll be around the house and she be checking on stuff. I gotta make sure they send flowers to Mother Tabs at the hospital. I gotta I gotta check on Frida. I gotta do this, I gotta do that, so and so is this, such and such baby did that. That's all she does all day long, every day. On top of the Bible, on top of I don't know, and all of y'all done had private conversations with her that don't nobody know about but y'all and her. You know that. And so we honor you, we esteem you on this birthday. You ain't getting older, you ain't getting older, you're getting better. And the older we get, the younger old gets. Amen? Clap your hands right there. So we want to bless her with an offering. If you want to go to her cash app, or we have a separate basket, if you want to put her an envelope in, can you bless the woman of God? Uh, if I was you, I'd sow $100 into her. I would. That 100 represents the best. 100%, 100-fold, keeping it 100. If I were you, that's what I would do, a minimum. Some of you should and can do more than that. But you should bless it with at least $100 if you can. If you can't, just do your very best. But I want you to bless, let your woman of God know that where I say your treasure is, where your heart is, let her know that you love her. And she'll know how much you love her. And you know what she does when she be looking? She, be, she prays over every envelope. She prays over every cash out. And she'll be saying stuff like, oh, I shouldn't take this. I should give it back. They don't have it. They got kids. They, got this. they need to do that. They shouldn't do this. That's, that's how she is. I didn't say I did it. <laughs> that's why y'all be giving me like $5. <laughs> that's all I bless the man of God. Everybody give $5 a piece. I ain't mad at you, because if I was you, I'd give me $5, too. <laughs> you want to come say something? Come on, sweetie, let the people, let the people love, on, love on the peoples. Bless the woman of God as she comes. Clap your hands for her. Let's honor and reverence her.
And then we're going to we're gonna bring it. I want you to go to cash. Those of you that can't go to cash app, if that's the way you're going to bless it. Amen. My goodness, my husband. Somebody say y'all's pastor. See that way we <laughs> we that way we get it off of us and put it on the person sitting next to you. Look at your neighbor and say it's on you now. <laughs> I appreciate you guys so much. Listen, my birthday is I'm not I'm not one of those individuals and I don't I'm not uh dishonoring this stuff my my husband said. But I'm not one of those people who got to celebrate their birthday all month long. <laughs> It's too exhausting. <laughs> I just want my birthday to be on my birthday. My birthday is officially Wednesday, but I want to take this opportunity to celebrate all of my February people. So would you stand up if you had a birthday in February too? Where are my February people? Winston, Elder Steve, Karen, come on. Y'all can do so much better than that. These are February, Mother Time go. Your birthday? That's why we act like we act. We're special. Come on, Pastor Darrell said, y'all crazy. <laughs> happy birthday, Elder Vicey, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. This is for everybody, because, I mean seriously, I personally, let me say this, I do not want you, those of you who are online, do not not tithe to God because of anything you give or say for me. I would rather you give to the house of God than to me. Because if you bless the house of God, you do bless me. If you can get that, if you can comprehend that. Because the work of the Lord is so important. And the last thing I want to say is I really, really appreciate where God is taking us. How many of you feel like God is taking you somewhere special? You can kind of feel like, come on, if you feel it. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel something you don't feel, but do you sense that your life is starting to come together bit by bit, piece by piece? Come on. I do. And not only that, you're being made aware of what needs to be taken care of. Prioritizing, taking care of what? You. Somebody say, take care of you. Take care of your physical being, your spiritual being, and your emotional being. Pastor said something very powerful. He said, let stuff go. Let stuff go. How many of you have, and I'm done, how many of you have a weekly trash week day? Every time you take out your trash, would you do this with me from now on? Prophetically, would you take out some trash out of your life? Would you do that? You know what, it's mine's is Wednesday, I'm Wednesday days. I say, you know what, I'm not about to be carrying this the rest of this week. I'm putting this out of here. I'm taking this off of my plate. I'm not dealing with this. Whether they let it go or not, you let it go. You let it go, you walk away from it. Okay. All right. I'm telling you, you're going to feel so much better, so much lighter, so much brighter. And if you're about living that good life, and if you're about living healthy life, and if you're about celebrating your life, because why are you here if you're not? Why do this? Say you're a Christian if you're not happy in your Christianity. Come on. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God in no way made itself of a representation or, rep or, or, or take the glory from God. But it's time for you to start living in your glory moments. It's time for you to start. See, you don't even want to celebrate yourself. It really is time for you to start celebrating the good things of your life and the good things about life. And so I want to take this opportunity to, before you bring your seed, before you give, you give it online, online, those of you that are super givers, we love you, we appreciate you. Those of you that are in the congregation that are supporters of the ministry, we love you, we appreciate you. But I need to do this altar call. I need you to purposely let it go. Let go of the childhood disappointments, let go of the marital disappointments, let it go. Pastor prayed it, and I saw some of you, some of you did it, and some of you didn't. But the expectation of this is that you are getting ready to live a better life. Thank you, thank you so much. 
Let's all stand to our feet and say, we're getting ready to live a better life. Not only am I getting ready to live a better life, it's getting ready to be a better life. Put your hands together if you receive that. Come on. Because doors are only going to open if you are expecting them to open. Good things are going to start to happen when you expect those good things to happen. I don't associate with a lot of negative people. I don't want to be around a bunch of people who are always looking for the bad and everything. Some people, when they come into your life, all they want to do is see bad stuff, see, read something bad, hear something bad, type something bad, print something bad. Get away from that kind of stuff. Get away from it and find the joy of life while, it's, while you're here. Come on, put your hands together because you're getting ready to find the joy of life. Come on. Whether it's a walk in the park, enjoy the walk in the park. Whether it's sitting down for lunch, enjoy. So, tell somebody, don't call me. I'm having, my, I'm having my lunch. I'm about to enjoy my lunch. I'm about to enjoy every part of my life. Come on and say it. Come on. Get it in your spirit. Get it in your spirit. Come on. I'm not going to stop until you get it in your spirit. Get it in your soul. I'm about to enjoy my life. I'm about to enjoy my home. I'm about to enjoy my family. I'm about to enjoy my moment. I'm about to enjoy my celebration. I'm about to enjoy my church time, my offering time, my, my pastor time, my, my, my worship time. Come on. Put your hands together because you got what I'm talking about. Come on. Did you get it? You get it? Because good things are getting ready to come into your life. Doors have been opened on your behalf. Anointings have been released if you receive it. Stop being stuck in the dry places. Get up and get up out of it. Get up and get up out of it. Shake the dust like Jesus said. He said if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Come on, let's do it right now. Do it right now. I'm not waiting on nobody to bless me. I'm going to bless myself and then as the Lord has blessed me, I'm going to bless him at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will boast in the Your best time wasn't in your 20s. Your best time wasn't in your 30s. Your best time is in the moment that you say, this is my best time. This is going to be the best time year right now somebody say right now right now come on somebody say and as you line it up God is lining it up and as you receive it God is releasing it come on my body is lining up my mind is lining up my family is lining up my children are lining up my church is lining up come on come on Open your mouth and uh, open your mouth and declare it. Open your mouth and decree it. Ain't nothing stopping you from your moment. Won't nothing stop you from your breakthrough. You are the best thing that has happened to the two, 2024. Ain't nothing better happening than you. Come on. Open those prison doors. Come on, open the prison doors. Open the prison doors. If Paul and Silas can open prison doors with their praise, you should be able to open the doors with your confession. Let the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be acceptable in his sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Come on. Come on. Reverse that curse. Reverse the generational things that have been following you. Unplant the planter. Supplant the plant, planter. Get it up. Pull it up. Uproot the weeds. Uproot the tears. Come on. Get it up. Get it out. Come on. And in my last 60 seconds, somebody say, I'm about building legacy. Come on, build a legacy. Build a legacy. I'm talking to somebody. You're not going to die leaving debt. You're going to die leaving the joy of the Lord. You're going to die leaving a testimony. Come on. Your family going to know you were the one that stopped everything that the enemy was intending to do. God sent you to destroy the work of the enemy. Come on. My 
my seed is getting ready to bring forth a harvest in Jesus' name. Say it. I dare you to walk out on that. I dare you to start giving right now. I dare you to decree it. I dare you to say it. I'm not just getting myself together. I'm getting things together. Mother Tab, I decree and declare everything that God spoke over your life shall manifest in so much more. Mother Tab, Mother, that's for you. I decree and I declare everything that God has said for your life is coming to pass. Your children's children are blessed because of the six, because of what you saw. So somebody say, because of what I saw. Somebody say, I'm the Joseph in my family. I'm the Joseph. I'm the Naomi in my family. Come on. I'm the Ruth. Come on. I'm the Esther. I'm the David. Come on. My children's children. Doctors, lawyers, politicians, professors, say it. Business owners, entrepreneurs, say it. I cancel every assignment that the devil sends against my family. Say it. I place a hedge around about them. Say it. They're blessed going out and they're blessed coming in. Say it, say it. My seed seed is blessed. Somebody say, long after I'm gone, the blessings of the Lord are gonna continue. Come on. I don't, I don't hear nobody in this church. I don't hear nobody in here, Jason. Elder Jason, I don't hear him, Jason. Come on. Say, my children's children's children are going to be blessed. Keep going. Keep going. The offering is blessed. Y'all can take it out. Somebody say, praise is in my family. Praise, I release praise in my family. I cancel the spirit of cancer, diabetes, heart attack. Disease. Come on, cancel it. Cancel it. Lupus, MS, cancel it. Cancel it. Oh, y'all don't want to help me? Y'all don't want to help me? I bind the spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus. I cast down every sick spirit in the name of Jesus. Every foul spirit in the name of Jesus. We bring it into submission into the word of God. We believe and we decree and declare that the Lord Jesus canceled the assignment of the enemy. Broke Satan's back. Released. Oh, come on. Help me, Marcus. Please help your mama. Help me. Wherever the soles of my feet touch, they I shall prosper. Somebody said, come on. Don't pray for me. Pray with me. Come on. Doors are open. Major doors are opening. Connecting doors to major doors. Solutions. Come on. Somebody say, solutions are coming into my pocket. I don't know. I bind the spirit of depression, anxiety, fear, worry, loneliness. Come on, help me, Lexi. Help me, baby. I take spiritual authority over the spirit of fear that's causing you not to walk out on the things of God. Come on. Somebody say, there ain't a devil in hell that can stop me. The Lord have encamped angels around about me. He established my name. My name means blessed. Oh, come on. Why y'all don't want to have no church? Why y'all coming in here and don't want to conclude the matter? What they doing? Say, my children are walking into scholarships. They're walking into blessings. 
that the words of my mouth are speaking. They will not labor hard like I did. They will not miss opportunities like I did. It will not take them 20 years to get to the promised land. We reverse the curse right now in the name of Jesus. We bring it into captivity and we release the anointing and the timing of God to be released over our children, over our family, over our finances, now! Oh, y'all don't wanna, hold on for a second there. Y'all don't wanna, y'all don't, they don't wanna go there. They don't wanna go there. Let me tell y'all something. Y'all can talk about expensive things all you want to. You can keep talking about what you don't want. Because you're looking at other people having these, but I don't want that. I don't want that either. I don't want that. Let me tell you something about a Rolex watch. Let me tell you something. A real one. T listen to me. Listen to me. Every other watch has to have the time set when you leave it and the battery dies. But the Rolex starts moving when you pick it up. Okay. And I know y'all can't, well, I'm not trying to insult nobody. But when you get into the timing of God, and God said, if you believe a thing, it shall be established. It's the same principle. The minute you believe it, is the minute it activates. God said the reason why you're having problems is because you're looking for the wrong thing to happen instead of the right thing to happen. You're looking at the wrong time. You, but, well, it must not be time for me to get blessed because I, it, and nobody else is getting blessed, so I shouldn't get blessed. Well, I, it, it, it looks like I shouldn't have this because other people are going through what they're going through. But they didn't go through the struggles you've been through. So don't you feel bad, Joseph, when God calls you to the high places. Because if he's calling you to the high places, it's to bring the rest of the people up to the high places. Tell somebody, don't get jealous when God elevates me. Because if you have been by my side, I'm going to bring you where I am. That's why Jesus said, I go to my father. He said, I go to my father. But you will come there too. He said, all you got to do is activate your faith, live your life in me, and I will do the rest. God said, I'm getting ready to make everything make sense in this season. Some of y'all say, why did I have to catch the disease? Why did God let me catch that? I'm gonna be careful now, I'm gonna be real careful, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. God said, I just wanted to see how you were gonna act when you got the test. Cause it is a test, but it ain't the truth. I just wanted to see how you was gonna act when you got, did, when you had to get the layoff and you didn't get the money. I just wanted to see how you was gonna act. I, I just wanted to see how you were gonna act when you got the appointment and then you got disappointed. I just wanted to see how you was gonna act. I just wanted to see how you were gonna act if you got rebuked or challenged. I just wanted to see how you were gonna act. Because if you acted right, the Lord said that the double is on the way. The double. The healing. I don't care if it's stage 12. God said, I can reverse the thing. I'll give you 15, 20, 30 more years if you praise me right. I felt that shoot through my spirit. If you praise me right, I turn your liver, your kidney, your spleen, your pancreas back like a newborn baby. It's 
is just a test. Go to 10 people and tell them it's just a test. Hurry up. Online type is just a test. It's just a test, Angie. It's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test. Elder Penny, touch 10 people and tell them, say it's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test, Nigel. Every cell in your brain is being healed right now in Jesus' name. It's just a test. Tanya, they can look all they want. It's just a test. Go ahead and praise it. Go ahead and turn it up. Go ahead. Some people got to sit in the classroom a long time working on the same test. But somebody say, I paid attention. I got the revelation. I understand the plan and the purpose. It's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test, Jason. It's just a test, Elder Florine. It was just a test. Back and forth to the doctor, back and forth making you feel sick. And now you're ministering to people. God said that the enemy was trying to subvert you. He was trying to distract you. He was trying to delay you. He was trying to move you out of position. It was just a task. I don't know who this is for. Y'all making me cut up for no reason. Don't act ugly. It's just a test. Let them act ugly. Don't you act ugly. Somebody say, let them act up. Let them cut up. I mean, let me stop. I don't, I know what I know, what I know. You wrote your vision, your goals, your vision. Leaders, y'all still praying over? We still praying over every single day. He said, write the vision because it's about to come to pass. I don't, Elder Mumford, I don't care how the hard the struggle was. It felt like giving up. But God said, the double is on the way. I know you can't comprehend it, but there are five of y'all that are getting ready to have double salaries. I know you can't, I know they can't comprehend that. Because they they're wondering how. I don't even ask God how no more. I'm done. Get ready to go back to the doctor. They ain't going to, nothing. They ain't going to find nothing. Nothing. I've been in the doctor when the doctor saw things and then went back and God told me, go back and go get a check. Nothing. And the doctor be sitting there looking like, well, okay. All you did was make me have a bill. But okay. Well, I, what I saw before, I see nothing. nothing. The enemy thought he was going to get in our relationship, but tell him, say nothing. Nothing. The enemy thought he was going to tear the church up. Somebody say nothing. Nothing. You're getting ready to walk so confident in this season. You're going to forget when you were messed up. Pastor Dale laughed at me. He said, you got two weeks, three weeks in the world, you've been running in there having a whole nother service. He said, but when I, every time you do that, it's marked on his calendar, he said, every time you do that, we get miracles, signs, wonders, promotions, raises. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody say the double. Double. That's why the enemy was trying to get you to stop tithing, stop believing, stop joy, having joyfulness. He wanted you to miss your opportunity. You're not gonna miss this one. You're not gonna miss this one. I called, I'm done now. I called Anijah the minute the God gave me this word. 
soon, soon as New Year hit, the Lord said, I reset the time. He said, in 2023, time was going by so fast. He said, I'm going to slow it down so you can enjoy what I'm getting ready to do. As soon as 2024 hit, time started slowing down, just slowing down. I was like, oh my God, things have norm like, seem like they're normal. After a storm, this is what y'all have to realize, after a storm, you look at the situation, you're like, oh my God, it tore up everything. And then in a storm, you notice what people do? They realize that their life was more important than the stuff that they had in eyes. Your life was spared in this storm. Your life was more important than anything you lost. Lost friends, so what? Gain new ones. Gain new ones. And what did Dr. Darrell say? The people that are coming in your life now are the ones God intended for you to have. Mm -hmm. Ain't gonna be no hard working on relationships in this season. It's just gonna fit. It's gonna be nice, it's gonna fit. That's why you had to wait because everything is getting ready to fit. God said the double has already been released. The seed has a seed. The harvest has a harvest. Everything is doubling, everything is gonna be, it ain't gonna, uh-uh, mm -mm. God reset the time. He's healed you, he's touched you, he's brought you out. All you gotta do is believe him and trust him. Put your hands together right now and say, I got it, Pastor. I love y'all so much. Thank you very much for sowing into my life. I don't ask people to do it. If they do it, it's because they love me or God told them to do it. If they believe in me, if they believe in me, what God said shall surely come to pass. Say, it's coming to pass. I'm going to do a quick, any announcements? Real quick. Come on, receive me, Elder, as she comes. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to remind you, we are having our auditions and we're having our play rehearsals on every Saturday until we have our presentation. Please come out and be a blessing. We need people to come out to be extras. We have um, non-speaking parts as well as some a couple more roles that we have to fulfill. It's going to be very nice. You all are going to enjoy it. But come out and be a blessing to your church. Thank you. Got one? How y'all doing? I just want to thank all the men that came out yesterday. Uh, how y'all doing? For sure. I just want to thank all the men that came out yesterday, brought y'all kids out, uh, for everybody that sent their kids with us. We had a great time yesterday, had a really good turnout. We're definitely going to be having some more things coming up. I will keep everybody posted, but we're going to keep this going, and we got a lot of good stuff planned. So I appreciate y'all, for sure. Next order of business. We're going to drop the date for a date night, a young couple's date night that we have for all of our youth. It's going to be all of our youth married, unmarried, dating, aspiring to marry. This is who this is for. It's going to be March 29th, and it is going to be not your ordinary date night. We are going to be cooking a meal with our beautiful deaconess, um, Leisha Battle. She will be guiding us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She will be guiding our young couples and teaching them how to make a meal from scratch, from beginning to end, teaching us how to plate it. They don't, you know, I mean, <laughs> but teaching us how to um, make it from beginning to end, how to plate it, all of that, and it's going to be great for our youth couples. It's going to be a way to teach them how to connect in a healthy and fun way, and we are looking forward to that, so, yeah. We will have... <laughs> We will have the flyer uh, posted, or have it, yes, posted next week, and it will have all of the details to let you guys know what was going on. So, yes, thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Come on, come, come. what's wrong with y'all? You got young people, young ministers, deacons doing things in the church, and y'all looking at them like, come on. Everybody in the church ain't going to the nursing home. Stay around young people, you'll stay young, amen? amen. That's a blessing. It's a true blessing. I thank y'all so very much. Keep going. You know you got my support. I know everything that they're doing. Um, it's, it's a blessing. Let's all stand to our feet. I am challenged. I'm telling you, come church on Tuesday. Why? Why is, why is prophetic power prayer important? Why? Because we need to pray together. 
We need to make the declaration together. We need to believe together. We need to pray together. Amen. God is so faithful, so good. Do me a personal favor. Would you do me a personal favor? Those of you who do shop and do shop, would you support Anaja? You guys support uh, local businesses, our business people in our church and our congregation. Would y'all do that? Whatever the business is, would y'all start supporting your people? I see different people with, with, with some Blanc Boutique stuff on. Thank you. My baby, yeah, she didn't ask me to do this. I'm doing it. She like, cut it out. I'm doing it. Amen. We don't, we don't do that. We, we don't, I'm not forcing nobody to spend. You know how people be like, don't, don't be forcing me. Nobody's forcing you. But there are good products over there. My nieces have good products. Other people, Winston has a good business. Get your dirty carpet clean. If, if, Get your couches clean. It's spring, spring is about to hit. Yes, I'm saying this. Yes, I am. Stop calling Stanley Steamer. Call your own cleaner. He does an excellent job. Excellent. Don't nobody clean carpet better than him than Dr. Dare. Support him. Get your carpet clean. How often should you get your carpet clean? Twice a year. Three times a year, depending upon your home. If you got pets. If you knew what I knew. You get your house cleaned, amen? Reach across the aisle, grab somebody by the hand and don't be intimidated to touch them. Come on. Come on. There we go. I wanna make this declaration. Say, we are a family. We're a spiritual family. Joined together in the word, by faith. What you go through, I go through. I'll pray you through. Pray me through and we will succeed. I believe the Lord is over our church, in our church, and with your help, with your help, we're gonna see manifestations in Jesus' name. God bless you, I love you, New Spirit. I love you online. Speak to somebody, love on somebody, encourage somebody. The altars are open if you need further prayer. You shouldn't until Tuesday, amen. God bless you, saints. Honor the Lord with our possessions. He will fill our life with plenty. We hope to see you back here again on Sunday in person or online at the same time. Also, join us on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. in person or online for a prophetic prayer service. And if you're looking to draw closer to God and get a greater understanding of his word, we encourage you to join us for Bible studies on Thursdays online at 7.30 p.m. with Dr. Daryl Scott. We hope you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you soon.